Everybody say, drop the rock. No, that's not some beat for some DJ at a hip hop club saying. I want to talk to you today about drop the rock. I want you to take your Bibles now and I want you to turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. This is a passage that I'm sure you're familiar with the story, but I, I want you to read it. I hope you open your Bibles up and read it along with me because I, I want you to take some notes. John chapter 8, verse number 3. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him, that's Jesus, brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, Who is without sin among you? Let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It's one of my favorite stories out of the New Testament of the grace and the mercy of God. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Now, God, I pray that you'll give me strength, you'll give me your words to say, and that this seed of your word will fall upon good ground, that literally it will bring about transformation within our lives, that our ears would hear what your spirit would say to us. Thank you, Lord, for what is going to happen in Jesus' name. And everybody again said, amen. amen. Now, let's walk through this, this story, and I'm going to point out some things to you. Back to verse number three. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, that's the religious leaders of the day, brought to him a woman caught in adultery. So, so this woman was caught in the very act of adultery, one translation said. Now, I don't need to be descriptive to you. I think you understand exactly what was going on there. But, you know, I'm, I'm smart enough. I took biology in school, and um, the last I understood of this, that it still took two to tango. So my obvious question is, where's the guy? Notice the women are the ones who said that. Where, 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 where's he at in this? So we've just got this one woman. We got this woman who all right, is being victimized by the scribes and the Pharisees. And it says that they brought her and they threw her right in the midst. Visualize with me a public square, a public place where Jesus was traveling or was teaching. And, and there as these scribes and these Pharisees had drug her out from the very act, drug her out there and threw her down in the midst. All the crowd is around. You can imagine how that they're looking at her and how they're pointing at her. And there in the midst, they said, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act. No one disputed that. There was no need for a trial. It was obvious. She was guilty of that very thing. Here's another thing. Sin will always start private. No one will ever find out. No one will ever know. How many of you ever, the devil's ever lied to you that way? Oh, just do this. No one will know about it. Nobody will ever find out about it, whatever it is. But he'll always start out privately, but the devil will always expose you publicly. And all of us can give our testimony of those things that we did when suddenly we realized, wait a minute, now everybody knows. He said, nobody would know. Now everybody knows. That's where this woman was. Ridicule put down in the public square. Verse 5 says, Now Moses in the law, this is the Pharisee saying, commanded us that we should, that she, that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. They, they told Jesus, This woman deserves to be stoned. That's, that's what the law says. Now, now, stoning was a terrible thing. Stoning, to me, would be one of the most cruelest forms of execution. They would take a person. They would take them to a public square. They would line them up against a wall, or, or they would circle around them, and everyone would have their rock. They would usually be small rocks, sometimes larger, but, but rocks about the size of a baseball that they could get a good throw on. And you can imagine how cruel that would be to have that person standing there. 
As people began to hurl rocks at them and stones at them, they, they would strike them and the pain that would be there. This would not be a quick death. This would be a slow death, an anguishing death. They would begin to bleed and, and there. It, some even describe that there'd be so many rocks that would be thrown that literally that person's body would be piled over with rocks until finally either they crushed them or they had bled out. That's what they were saying about this woman. That's what they were saying that needed to be done. They brought their rocks with them. They were ready to go. Here's the woman. We've got the rocks. This is what the law says now, Jesus. This is what we're going to do. And no doubt they had done that many times. But they said, let's see if we can trap Jesus. And the enemy always wants to trap you. The enemy always wants you to get into a place that you don't know how to answer. Because the reality is, the devil knows all of us have come short of the glory of God. I think I'm in the right place. Let me say it again. Just, just straighten your halo around your horns for just a minute now. I said, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none righteous. All of us are guilty. All of us deserve punishment. And that's where this woman was right there. We know what she needs. We know what she deserves. We know what the law says. And so they're standing there with rocks in hand says, come on, Jesus, give us permission. We'll do this. What do you say about that? Maybe that's the way that you feel. Maybe you've been in that situation where you know the guilt of your own sin. You know what you've done. You, you, you know what you have committed against God and against man. You, you know that you're guilty. All of us are that way. And here we are with Jesus standing there, these that are accusing her rightfully, and now we're listening to what Jesus, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm listening to what Jesus is about to say because that was me laying there in that dirt. That was me there in that situation. That was me there accused and, and guilty of all sin, needing punishment within my life. And so when these people are asking Jesus, Jesus, what do you want us to do? I'm listening very close because that could be me down there. Notice what Jesus said. It said, but Jesus. Oh, I like that. Everybody else may have given up on me. Everybody else may be ready to throw the rock at me. Everybody else may be ready to kill me for what I've done. But Jesus. Oh, I'm so glad Jesus showed up on the scene. I'm so glad that when my accusers were there, Jesus showed up. But Jesus. And what did he do? It says he stooped down. He stooped down on the ground and began to write something there in the dirt. All the others are standing there with rocks in hand ready to go. Jesus stooped down. He got his hands dirty. He didn't stand with the, those that were condemning her. He stooped down to help her. Friends, the scripture tells us Jesus didn't come into this world to condemn the world, but he came to this world that through him the world might be saved. I'll give you some good gospel news today, friends. Jesus is not here to condemn you. He's here today to help you get out of the mess that you are in. That's why he came. That's how we got saved, that Jesus was willing to come down from heaven, that he was willing to walk among us, be born of the Virgin Mary, live a sinless life, die on the cross for us. He came down and got his hands dirty for us. He was willing to die for us. He was willing to give his life for us. Jesus stooped down for you and for me. Oh, come on, somebody ought to get happy about that. We were in the dirt of life. We were cast down. But Jesus said, I'll come down out of heaven and I'll get right down there with you and I'll help to lift you back up. No one else may stoop down for you, but Jesus did. Aren't you thankful that Jesus stooped down for you? He's the good Samaritan. We were left beat up on the side of the road of life. Everybody else passed us by, but Jesus stopped by and said, let me help you. Let me pour in the oil and the wine. Let me get you to a place. That's what Jesus does. He'll meet your need. Verse 7 says, so when they continued ask him, he raised himself up and said to them, see, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. The, the devil will never shut up. He's going to keep pointing his old bony finger at you and say, you did this, you did that. And many times he's right because we did it. But can I give you good news? The devil's not going to shut up, so Jesus will stand up to him. He, he is our advocate. He's the one that stands between us and the devil. Here's what Jesus told them when he looked at him. He said, Jesus told him this. He says, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone. All right? See, the crowd's there. They're ready. They, they, they've got their stone in hand. Their self-righteous anger is, is ready to be poured out on her. They've justified their action because the law says this is what we've got to do. But Jesus flipped the script on them. Again, he said, okay, all right, that's what you want to do. And go ahead, but wait a minute. 
Whoever hasn't done anything wrong, here, here, you throw the, you throw the first rock. So, so we'll do this. She's done wrong, so let the guy who hasn't done any wrong, let them go first. Then what did he do? He stooped right down in there and started writing some stuff back in the sand. I don't know what he started writing in there. I don't know if he was writing the phone numbers of the Pharisees' girlfriends. But whatever he wrote there, it made an impact on that crowd. They stopped. They paid attention. Because look what it says in verse number nine. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. When Jesus said what he said and, and did what he did, it says that it convicted them. See, that's a word that we've lost. We've lost the word convictions. People used to say, I'm convicted about that. I've got a conviction about that, convicted of doing that. What that simply means is that's the voice of the Holy Spirit that, that speaks to us and tells us when we're doing something we shouldn't be doing. When we're saying something we shouldn't be saying. When we're acting the way that we couldn't be acting. And he tells us, wait a minute, that was wrong. You need to change that. How many have heard that still small voice? I can say many of you, more of you need to hear that voice. <laughs> Thank God for the Holy Spirit within our life. Now, conviction is not condemnation. That's not what conviction is. The Holy Spirit convicts us. He merely tells us when we're wrong. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. The Holy Spirit's the one that lets us know that we're a sinner, that we need God. See, the most dangerous type of cancer is the cancer that you don't know that you have until it's too late. No symptoms, no pain. Sadly, I've seen that happen in so many people. Until finally, they come in and say, Doctor, I don't understand this. I've just got a few symptoms of the doctor has to give them the bad news. It's too late. It's already throughout your body. There's no sense in symptoms until it, until it overtakes. That's why conviction is so powerful. That once we begin to do something wrong, once we know oh, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have acted that way, I shouldn't have had that thought, I shouldn't have responded that way, the Holy Spirit tells us so that we can say, wait, I'm not going to do that again. I'm sorry, forgive me for doing that. I'm going to turn from that way. I'm going to repent of it. And I'm going to start doing what is right. Thank God for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. He came to grant us mercy. Maybe when they heard Jesus and saw what he was writing, maybe at that point when he talked about you that's without sins, you cast the first stone. maybe it was at that point that the Holy Spirit began to bring to their remembrance some of the things that they had done, some of the sins that they had committed. They probably said, wait a minute, how, how can I stone this woman when in reality I deserve to be stoned? When, when I've done things that I shouldn't have done. Church, can I just tell you right now, we need to stop being so judgmental. I'm going to wait on you on that one. I know some of you are judging me right now, but I'll say it again. We need to stop being so judgmental. Before we're so quick, to judge others, we might want to stop and think about what we've done. It's amazing how self-righteous we can get. Now, when I was young, I was quick to judge. I'll just be honest. I, I, was, I can't believe they did that. I, I can't. That, that'll never happen to me. Oh, and the old folks in the audience are laughing right now. My kids will never do that. And the people who say that have never had kids. Can I get an amen? People without kids criticize, criticize parents with kids. Well, just wait till you get your own. And that whole tune will change. See, the older I get, the more I realize how much I need the mercy of God. The older I get, I realize really how imperfect I am, how messed up I am. Well, you ought to be getting, oh, no, I think it's more of just the realization of really how inadequate I am and how much more I need God's love and God's grace within my life. Because let me tell you, I, I want to pour that out to folks. Because the same grace that you might need for your child, I might need it for my child next. And it is amazing as we get older, we suddenly recognize, hey, my kids need help, and your kids need help, I need help, you need help. Why don't we quit judging one another, and why don't we just see how we can help one another? I need to be careful how I judge. 
Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you'll be judged. And with what measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye when you've got a a plank in your own eye? We've got to get to the point that we say, wait a minute, I'm not going to be like those Pharisees. I'm not going to stand there and point my finger at somebody because I've done things in my life. I may not have done what they've done, but I'm not perfect, and I've had sin in my life. I've had shortcomings in my life. I don't need to be standing here holding this rock, throwing it at them. I need to drop the rock. Somebody say, drop the rock. If it weren't for the grace of God, we could be right there. If it wasn't for the grace and the mercy of God, we could be right there. Here's something else I notice about this text. It says, beginning with the oldest, they began to walk away. It wasn't the youngest that did it first. No, the youngest, they've got their rock. They're ready. Come on, we'll do this. But I think it was the older folks that suddenly had the perspective of age. See, we who have been walking with the Lord for the longest should be the first to drop our rocks. We should be the first to extend mercy to those that are in need. It says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. We've got to begin to look at people through the eyes of Jesus. Not condoning sin, Because sin is what kills. Sin is what got them in the shape that they're in. But looking past the sin and understanding the power of the Savior. Of reaching that person. That's somebody's son. That's somebody's daughter. That's somebody's mama. That's somebody's daddy. And yes, they're in sin, but I was in sin. But thank God Jesus came and saved me. And if Jesus can save me, Jesus can save them. I need to get rid of this and I need to lift them up. It says one by one, they dropped the rocks and walked away. I I, I don't care if what they did is wrong. It doesn't matter what they've done. It's not our job to condemn them. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God has given us that opportunity to say, let me get you back into the fold. See, I, I can choose to throw my rock like the Sadducees and the Pharisees. I can choose to be one there that is saying, yeah, they deserve it and that, or I can be like Jesus and I can drop the rock. I can be like Jesus and say, I'm not going to condemn you either. I'm not going to be one that is standing here. I recognize what I've done in my life, and I'm going to drop the rock and allow that to be the the answer. Come on, somebody say, drop the rock. Next it says, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Because really, folks, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is what goes on between you and Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. It says in verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? In other words, Jesus says, okay, where are they at now? Where are all these folks that dragged you out there and and accused you and were ready to to pick up the stone and, and stone you? Where are they at now? Because suddenly they had a whole new perspective and they had dropped their rock and they had walked off one by one. Where are those accusers? And she said, no one, Lord. Now, this is a key that you can't miss. If you're not careful, you'll you'll go past it. Because I believe this, this is the powerful key that where most people get hung up. See, Jesus had dealt with the accusation of the enemy. He had dealt with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all right? Whoever's without sin, well, they knew they'd all had sin. And they knew that if they threw that rock, that they would be made out a liar. And then they would be stoned. So he dealt with them. And let me tell you, Jesus dealt with the devil on the cross of Calvary. Oh, I thought I'd get an amen there. In case y'all didn't know that good news. Jesus conquered the enemy at the cross of Calvary. Pay for our sins by the precious blood of the lamb that was shed for us. So Jesus Jesus did that on the cross of Calvary. The problem is not the accusations of the devil. What the problem is, is our self-condemnation. That we won't let our past go. In other words, we're guilty of stoning ourselves. Of self-inflicted wounds. Friends, there are things that have happened in our life. We've all got a past. Can I get an amen? 
All of us. Again, I'll repeat it. We've all sinned and come short. All of us have got a past. None of us are righteous. We, we recognize that. But if we're not careful, even after we've been forgiven by God and set on that new pathway, we carry our rocks with us. Rocks that are self-inflicted so that anytime someone starts to speak positive into our life, hey, you can do this and you can achieve this and you can overcome this situation and God's going to be with you and God's got a victory for you. We pull out our rocks, not to throw at somebody else, but to throw at us. We say, oh, but I've done this and I've come from this lifestyle and I come from this situation and this is what I was involved in the past. And if we're not careful, we will, we will hurl rocks at ourselves. There are things that have happened in our life that if we're not careful, they will trigger past accusations. We can be going along just fine, go along good and everything, and all of a sudden somebody will bring our past up or the devil will remind us of something that we did. And what we are is we're suffering from spiritual post-traumatic stress disorder. From PTSD. I've got a friend of mine who served in the military and he suffers from this. It's real. And we can be going along there and there'll be something that will happen, a sound or a situation. And, and just for that moment, he's back into that situation. He's back there in that, that situation of military fight. And then the fear comes on him and, and the situation health-wise, I mean, it takes him right back there. And many of you know what I'm talking about. That's what the devil wants to do to you. When you're getting ready to move forward for God and do something, he's going to remind you of your past. He's going to remind you of what happened to you when you were a child. He's going to remind you of what happened to you in that last marriage. He's going to remind you of what somebody said to you or what somebody said about you and that destroyed you and harmed you and hurt you. And suddenly, instead of moving forward for God, you've got that PTSD spiritually that you're just shrunk back and say, oh no, I can't do this. And you're hurling rocks at yourself. You're injuring yourself because of that. We're letting the tragedies of our past control our future. And I just declare to you today, you need to drop the rock. You need to recognize that God is for you. I don't care what your mom or your daddy did. I don't care what your past sins may have been. I don't care what you've been involved in. I don't care what people have called you. Well, they're this and they're that. They're a drug addict or they're a gang member or they're a homosexual or they're a lesbian or they're a wife beater or they're a liar or they're a drug addict. Whatever that is, you're not named by what you were. God's got a new life for you. God's got something better for you and you need to quit beating yourself up with the past. If you come to Jesus, all things pass away and all things become new. Quit carrying your rock around with you and drop the rock. Somebody say, drop the rock. Jesus asked her, who accuses you now? She said, no one. This is what brought about the release. The reality was everybody had gone, but catch this. It's not over until you say it's over. It's not over until you declare it's over. Has nothing to do with a large lady singing. My wife won't let me use that three letter word. That's, you're the one that's going to decide. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. If you're still holding on to that rock, if you're still doing it, 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 it's going to destroy you. You've been forgiven by God. Even if you've been forgiven by others, you need to drop the rock and forgive yourself. Well, why do you keep stoning yourself? Why do you keep self-inflicting those wounds? Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God's not condemning you. So why should you condemn yourself? You need to drop the rock. You need to let it go. What did Jesus say to her? Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Friends, who the sun sets free is free indeed. I'll say it again. God's not trying to get you. God's not trying to get you. God loves you to the point that he was willing to send his son to die for you. Jesus loved you enough that he was willing to die on the cross for you. The thief is the one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus is not here to throw the stone at you. Jesus is not here to do that. He's here to lift you up and restore you. And if you'll just let him do it. If you'll let him just like that woman did. If you'll let him pick you up out of the dirt. Jesus dropped the rock at the foot of the cross. 
He's not accusing you anymore. Jesus told her one more thing, and I'm about through. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Now, friends, the grace and the mercy of God is not a license to sin. Oh, I can get forgiven? Well, I can just keep on doing it. You've missed the whole aspect of it. The wages of sin is death. It kills you. It kills you spiritually. It kills you emotionally. It'll kill relationships, and it'll kill you physically. And that's why God hates sin. I hate cancer. My daddy died of cancer. I hate cancer. I've seen what it's done to my friends. I've, I've sat in, in hospital rooms. I've, I've watched people pass from that. And all of you can tell your stories. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That's why God hates sin, because it brings about spiritual death. He says, I want to show you what to do to, to, so that you won't have to have that. That's where his mercy and his grace is there. You have to choose, though. If I continue a lifestyle that destroys my body, then I'm going to reap that. And it's the same way spiritually. If I don't walk with God in his ways and his pathway, if I don't turn from my wicked ways and follow after him, that's where that spiritual death comes on. And God says, I want to give you life and I want to give it to you more abundantly. But you've got to go and you've got to sin no more. You've got to change that lifestyle. So to that woman there, Jesus, I'll lift you up. I'm not condemning you. Don't condemn yourself. I love you. I care for you. But listen, you can't go back to what you were. Come walk with me to what you can be. And I know many of you here today, you don't want to go back to what you were. You want a change in your life. Then come and walk with Christ and he'll give you that. All right. Let me tell you what we've learned today. Here's, here's what I want you to walk away with. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be so quick to judge people. I, I, don't, I don't want to be one of those that's so quick to pick up the stones and throw them. I want Cornerstone to be known as a church that that loves people and cares about people. That no matter where they come from, no matter what they've been in, no matter what they've gone through, I don't care who they are, Jesus died for them, we love them, we're not going to throw stones at them, we're going to get down in the dirt with them and we're going to help them up. We're going to help them with their situation, help them with their addiction, help them with their hunger, help them with their family. We're not going to throw stones at them, we're going to drop the stones. That, that's what we've got to recognize. Even, even when they've done wrong. That's, that's not the point. Ours is to reach out and to help. We've got to stop holding grudges against people. Some of you had people do you wrong, and you say, but you don't know what they did. No, I don't. And you're justified in your feelings towards them because they sinned, just like the woman in adultery. Yeah, she did it. You've got to make up your mind. Some of y'all been carrying rocks in your pockets. Everything's going good till somebody mentions that person's name or that situation or what they did. And as soon as they do, oh yeah, let me tell you about them. I'll tell you real quick what they did at me and you don't, you have no idea where they are at. You're just, let me tell you something. You're not hurting them. You're destroying yourself. You gotta drop the rock. You gotta let it go. You gotta quit stoning yourself. You gotta quit bringing harm on to you. You know that you're still holding that rock, that grudge? Let it go. Stop condemning yourself. I'll close this final story. I, 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 I give this to you for my own personal life. When I was young and I knew that God wanted me to go into the ministry, I've, I've known that for a long time as a young man, but I'd mess my life up. How many want to know how I messed my life up? None of your business. I'd messed it up to the point that I didn't think I could be used of God. I mean, the devil basically lied to me and just tell me, you're just, you're just lucky if you get to heaven. You better shut up and be quiet or they find out you're on this bus because they'll kick you off. And really, I felt that way. I felt so condemned. I, 
I would go to a church service like we had here and I'd sense the presence of God and I would say, I'm ready to do something for God. And the enemy would once again remind me, no, you can't, no, you can't. And the stones would come. And I'll be honest, I was throwing some of the stones. I was believing that. One day I was praying and I believe God gave me a vision. I don't know if I was dreaming or what, but it was very visible to me. I live in a little trailer, mobile home. Tahlequah, Oklahoma. I was going to college, working at the radio station, and I'd go home and pray and say, God, show me what you, I want to be free of this. And God showed me. I was in a prison cell. I, I could see people outside the bars. They'd be walking by, they'd be happy, they'd be doing things, but I was locked up. Anybody locked up wants to be set free. But I'd look at those bars, and I'd, I'd, I'd feel that desire, and I'd say, no, I can't. The bars are there. I'm locked up because of my past. I'm locked up because of what I did. I'll never be that. I just, boy, it was, it was just this back and forth war, and I was in torment. One day I was really praying. I said, God, show me. And he said, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go up and put your hands on the, on the door, on the bars. I walked up to those bars in that vision and that dream, and I put my hands on those bars, and when I leaned against it, the door swung open. I felt the Holy Spirit say, the door never was locked. I set you free. I paid the price for your sin. You've been setting in that condemnation, and that verse came to me that is so real. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Some of you have messed up. You've blown it. You did wrong. You're just like the woman. Hear me today. Jesus is not condemning you if you'll turn to him. You can find the abundant life that he has for you. But some of you have been throwing the rocks at yourself. God's ready to do that for you today if you'll just drop the rock. I want you to stand with me all over this place. We're going to do something very unique. Please don't leave. Please please don't leave. I really believe that God has touched many of you here today. I could see you as I was, as I was preaching. It was ringing home to you. I need to drop the rock. So the ushers are going to come now, and they're going to stand right here in these aisleways. And guess what I've got for you today? I've got rocks for you. So I tell you right now, some of you need to drop the rock. Some of, may, some of you may have brought your own rocks with you, okay? Sincerely, some of you do. Oh, they may not be like this, but you've got them in your pocket. I'm, I'm, I've been praying for you. I've been praying on this for over a month now. That for this moment that's about to happen, some of you are going to drop the rock. Some of you are going to be free of the condemnation. Some of you are going to give up the grudges that you've held against other people that has destroyed your relationship with that person and has kept you from having the, the relationship that you want and desire to have with God. So this worship team is going to sing through one time. We're not going to take long. You say, Pastor, this message is for me. Now, these were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were religious folks. These were churchgoers. Maybe you're here today and you say, I'm that woman. I've been caught. I need Jesus. He's here today not to condemn you, but to lift you up. Maybe you need to forgive somebody. Maybe you need to forgive yourself. But in whichever way, you need to drop the rock. So when they start singing and when I give them the cue in just a second, I want you to step to the nearest aisle. If this message has touched you, you're going to walk down the aisle and you're going to get a rock. And then I want you to come and stand right here and I'm going to give you further instruction and then we're going to go. But this message has touched somebody. Let me pray. Father, thank you for what's about to happen. Thank you for the miracle that's about to take place. Thank you, God, that you've broken up the fallow ground. You've broken up the hardened hearts. You've let us see the rocks that we hold in our hands, how we've been judgmental towards people, how we've condemned people, how we've, how we've held a grudge against them, and Lord, even how we have held ourselves back. So God, today, today, Lord, is our day of freedom and liberation. 
Thank you for these that are going to step to the aisle and make their way to the front of this auditorium. In Jesus' name, they're singing, you come right now.